going to see you here today and who's going to be putting the program on. And uh, I'll be back up at the program to tell you a few more things about Center School and what we're doing. Thank you very much. That was Rich Murray, the president of Cornerstone. He forgot to tell you that part. Uh, um, Joe Carr this morning handed me a copy of this book, which is just out today. And one of our members opened it up, and there's a beautiful picture of the two buildings that burned yesterday. Uh, Ron Grimes is the one who's, who will be speaking to you later, who put this book together, and it's available at the Historical Society in their gift shop. So the book. Many, many old photographs, some of them from postcards, some of them just photographs. You might want to check that out. Um, if you are researching the history of an old property here in Madison, uh, there are three obvious places to go. <laughs> oh, I had the mouse there. She was, uh, was inadvertently <laughs> tapping. So. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Mary Frances O'Connor is here today to tell you what you will find there and how you will go about searching it. The library also has a special regional collection, and the Historical Society has an archives that Ron Grimes and his wife Jackie have spent untold hours putting, to putting together a, a wonderful collection. <coughs> so uh, we'll start the program. Well, each of these people is going to briefly tell you what the materials they have cover. And then we're going, I, uh, Marilyn Bear called me. Is she here today? There's Marilyn Bear. She said, I'm so excited about your program. I have just bought a little shop down on Main Street. And I said, we're looking for a property to serve as a guinea pig. You want to be a guinea pig? She said, sure. So these people are going to tell you how Marilyn could go about searching the history of her property. Uh, and then, of course, you, we will have a question and answer period before we let you loose on the cookies. And the DVD that Cornerstone has just uh, put out that covers the Lord film from Madison in the 30s and the mid-40s propaganda film about Madison is available by the cookies. So, um, Janice Barnes, the Regional History Librarian, would you like to start?
something happens to the building, that we have a record of that property, so if another building should happen to go up there, we've still got the history of what was there before. That's my teaching. Um,
add the little schematic drawing here. And when you come up the stairways, <coughs> you start with the number one going across the left. The numbers that are on the little squares and rectangles here, uh, on the file cabinets especially, correspond So if you look over here under file cabinets and it's number one says downstairs. There will be a number one on the first file cabinet. And then there's a, a brief description of what is in that file cabinet. If you follow those numbers on the file cabinets and compare them to the numbers in the brochure, it should give you a brief summary of what is in that file cabinet. Um, we do have local newspapers that begin, so actually there are a, a couple that go back in the uh, 1870s. But um, we do not have every newspaper. We do not have every newspaper published or covered. But there, from about eight. Up to the present, we have some representation of them by the newspapers. There is an exception from between 1901 and 1908. We have no newspapers for that seven to eight year period, which is very frustrating at times because you find an obituary. Article that you read, and we do not have the newspapers. And it's not just us, we do not exist in the State Library, we do not have them. The um, Mormon collection does not have them. They just come in the newspapers where Michael Film and Drift are not there. And you will find that there are periods in the newspapers where we do have. For the most part, we've been helping with newspapers for almost another year. Uh, and that's quite a collection. Um, the other things that I think would, I, I mentioned family files, which, which is, starts in uh, uh, drawer five up there in the vertical files. Um, other things that I think might be helpful, um, census records in, I believe it was 1900, and depending on who was taking the census, sometimes very detail-minded people kept track of the streets in town that he was doing the census. doesn't give an actual number, but it gives a good idea of where the person is in the field. But from, from 1900 uh, forward, the uh, street addresses were along the side of the, the census. So you may miss them because they're usually running up the <coughs> on the actual outside of the census, but it'll say second street or west street or main. So that's a little bit of a guide also. Uh, we do have census records on Michael Hill from, well, we have the census is actually from 1820 to 1930, which was the last time they did been released since 1930. We also, on the computer for patrons, have <coughs> called ProQuest by and Spy. Heritage Quest, which is uh, it's census records and it does not cover all censuses, but the two important censuses of 1860 and <coughs> 1870, and then the 1900, 1910, and the 1920 censuses are on that program, and it is free to the public. You just need to stop by the desk. Combination of the and you can use these from home on your computers. 
find that on the main page of the library. It's like a fairy picture. I'm sorry, I don't remember which side the button is on to click for that, but I believe it's a matter of clicking on that. It will take you into it and you can do it easily that way. Census reports are important in a way because Census records, uh, I don't think are play a major part in it, but we do have them, which they will help you a lot. Um, maps and atlases, I mentioned the, the Sanborn maps, which are very good. We also have uh, flat maps, uh, and we refer to them as the historical. told it was a 76, it was a centennial type map, but I don't know. The two years difference is a little difference anyway. But we have the flat maps for the 1870 and the 1900 done in book form. Now these maps are on the wall upstairs, but it's so much easier to get that book out and look at the different sections. <coughs>
second one had a fire on the second floor. Um, but as many as many records as possible were retrieved and saved back then. This was in the 1980s and 50s. Um, I'm going to Census 
So that's really important that you just get going and all of a sudden you feel like you're not searching the name and the people that you can in the area that you really want. Uh, the names, the street names were different in the old days. Main out here now used to be Main Cross Street. Jefferson Street, which goes north and south, was Main Street because the river was so important. You will find, uh, as you go back, you want to watch, nowadays it usually says the consideration is one dollar, another good and valuable consideration. Or it will be for love and affection when it's a change in ownership in a family. Uh, back then they actually put the amount of money. And as you're going back, let's say you're in 
only once several years ago and if you've never done this it's amazing that you actually get to go in there and handle these original documents it, I I just I found that just unbelievable um, but that's the way it's done here and uh, appreciate it while we have it <laughs> thank you very much Ron Franz, the archivist of the Historical Society, has, has prepared a PowerPoint presentation, which I tried to give you a preview of. Um, here's Ron. picture should get a little bit better as uh, in the next few moments the uh, projector takes a, a few minutes to warm up. Uh, could we turn some of the, the front lights down? Can that be possible? It might be a little more visible with that. Okay. Yeah, we may be put in total darkness. Yes, we may. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about what we have at the Historical Society. Uh, if you haven't visited us before, we're over on First Street, uh, just a little bit west of the Lanier Mansion, uh, just behind the railroad station, which is also owned by the uh, Historical Society and operated as part of its museum operation. Uh, we have uh, the side entrance as you uh, approach us. Uh, the research library and archives is off uh, in a separate part of the building. When you come in there, we're open on Wednesday from uh, 10 to 4.30, and uh, if we get more
more volunteers will be open more uh, if you can't make it on a Wednesday, a lot of people are working, we'd be glad to make an appointment with you to uh, have us uh, work with you on a Saturday or a Sunday. Very flexible. Uh, when you come in, this is uh, what, our, what you would first see as you come in, the storage stacks of the, the material that we have archived. We also have a reading room area where you can do your research. A lot of the material has been uh, made available. You can see the rack of maps and uh, indexes that you're free to browse through. We also have a very respectable collection of, uh, of books, uh, many of them of local history and Indiana history. The sort of things that we have at the, uh, the research library complement what the, uh, the courthouse and the public library has. We each seem to have our own specialty. At the uh, Historical Society, we'll go into these in detail, but we have tax records, we have copies of the city directories and flat maps, and also uh, uh, among the things that we can offer that's, that's somewhat as unique as our photograph collection and uh, some of our family history files. We'll go into this in a little bit of detail. Uh, the most common questions that people ask when they come to visit us to, to research uh, their property, the most popular one singly is, uh, when was my house built? But also they want to find out more about the people uh, who lived in the house and also what changes have occurred, occurred to the house over the years. Now to do the research for this uh, presentation, we selected one house that was suggested at 814 West Main Street. Uh, one of the, uh, the houses here uh, is typical of the shotgun houses that were built during a certain time. And we chose this just pretty much at random to see what could we find. So wherever we have material uh, that I'm presenting to you, we'll try and zero in on this place. Now, for the question, when was my house built, the two things that we can help you with uh, are tax records in particular, and also another good source is uh, newspaper articles where uh, something about the house or the family may have uh, been recorded. The uh, tax records that we have at the Historical Society, first of all, they're only for the city of Madison, and that's the city of Madison in this time period of 1837 to 1905. So like Meredith said, the, uh, the hilltop would not be included in that. Uh, and during this time period, the city did its own tax assessing. It's now a township and county function, but at the time, the city kept their own tax records. Uh, these tax records were uh, maintained alphabetically, the ones that we have. So to use them properly, you do have to have the owner's name. Uh, the records consist of a, a separate ledger book for each year that uh, can be researched. This is what the books actually look like. You're working with very old records, and when we haul them out, we ask you to use white gloves and uh, treat them uh, with a great deal of respect because they are a unique resource for doing research. Now, if we were to pull one of those books out for 1862, this is pretty much what it would look like. It's alphabetic, but uh, within the, the first letter of the alphabet, you're going to have to scan through to find the particular name that you're interested in. When you do find that name, then it has a detailed description uh, of the property itself. The first column, or the second column there is the lot number, and then it has a, a more detailed description. Like that's lot 106, the old town, uh, and then it goes into a detailed uh, description of that portion of the lot. Now, if you go over to the right-hand side, you'll find a valuation of the property. And this is the figure that will change from year to year and will be a clue to you as to when the house was built on the property. Many of these properties were valued generally at $100 or $200. You go from year to year and you find there was a big jump to $600 or something like that. That's a clue that that's when the house was built. 
Another source uh, that uh, often is overlooked are the newspaper articles that uh, often made mention of someone building a house. Uh, there's an index that was compiled by the, the ladies of the DAR, and they did a wonderful job of going through the newspapers from 1817 uh, all the way through 1886. Uh, it was done primarily for genealogy research, but it also uh, had a lot of other information, and it, they're just fun to read through. Uh, we have a copy of it and several volumes of it. Uh, the library has a copy, I believe it's in a big red bound book uh, that's all in a single volume. So it has an index and then the index takes you to a particular page. The actual, the uh, uh, entire volume is in chronological order by date, but the index is alphabetical. So if you have a name, you go to the, uh, the page where that name is mentioned, it gives you uh, a listing somewhat like this. This is typical 1851 page, and I find myself bogging down and reading the whole thing because there's so many other things going on that are just neat to read about. Uh, accidents, uh, people visiting. But as you look closely at this one, uh, they made mention that two buildings were being built on West Street. Uh, now, you would have to then, this would give you information where you could go to tax records and get more information on exactly what building that was. So it's a, it's a wonderful resource. And then you find that May 20, 1851, you come over to the library and you pull the microphone file and you'll get the full newspaper article to see what the whole story was. And they have a lot more information than was mentioned in this brief summary. Next question, who lived in my house? Uh, the different sources that will help you with that are the deed records. Uh, there's flat maps available for some of them, the city directories that were mentioned, and also the family history files will tell you a little bit about the, uh, the families that were there. Now, the deed records, the best source is the courthouse, uh, and that's where you're going to have to start to get the names that you're going to be doing further research. Another source is the, uh, the deed records that have been recorded in microfilm, and those are uh, a little more readily available uh, on the microfilm machines at the, uh, the library here. Now, there is a separate index to those, an alphabetic that will take you to a page. I'm not that familiar with it. Each volume has its own index at the beginning of that volume. Okay. It makes interesting reading. Uh, at the Historical Society, we have a limited collection of original deeds. Uh, they're very scattered. Uh, I don't know how we came into possession, probably when they were being thrown out uh, at one time or another. But if we happen to have the deed, it's a real treasure. Uh, not that it tells you an awful lot of information, but just seeing the original documents is, is fascinating. One of our earliest ones is from 1850, when uh, the town was originally being developed. And this is a deed for lot number 51. It's kind of hard to read, but the lot sold for $60 then. And uh, it was signed by the four original developers of uh, Madison, which included John Paul. And you can see a signature uh, over right there, along with the other people that signed it. Uh, so, the, we have probably about three to four hundred deeds, and uh, they have not been indexed and alphabetized, so uh, you would have to know the approximate time and then just do a needle in a haystack search, but if you come up with it, it, it really makes a, an interesting addition to your property history. Another collection that we have, which is a real treasure, is the Amalora Petty title abstract collection. Uh, Anna Laura Petty, among many other things she did in the community, she did professional title and abstract researching. And if it happened to be a problem, and, and her collection of papers for the, uh, the properties that she researched were given to us. They're in the possession of the Historical Society. And uh, we're in the process. Bob Cook here has been, uh, his wife Mary Ann have been doing a wonderful job of indexing and identifying the, the contents of it. But if, 
it happens to be a property that she did do research on, it'll save you a lot of time because it takes it step by step back through to the original uh, sale of the property. And uh, this is a, just a typical example. This is the sort of description that's given. Very detailed, you know, 30 feet, 31 feet, one inch, and uh, the, the uh, exact dimensions of the property are given. And then it goes back from there, taking sometimes all the way back to John Paul. So, uh, like I say, this is not a complete collection of, of every property, but it, uh, if it was one that she was hired to do the research on, it'll save you a lot of time to use this collection. Uh, plat maps are another uh, interesting and very, very informative source of material. Now, you have two separate directions you go in depending on whether it's in the city of Madison or whether it's out in the, uh, the rural areas of Jefferson County. We have an excellent collection of the, uh, the rural plat maps, land ownership maps, and these are the big wall maps that Janice was mentioning that have each individual landowner. And then the city plat maps are not as detailed, but they do have footprints and uh, interesting uh, information related to it. Just taking a closer look, the 18, we decided it's 1878, not 1876. <laughs> <laughs> but we, what we did was we took uh, the big wall map and we scanned it and put it into book form which is available at the library or also at the Historical Society, and copies are available for purchase if researchers want it. But just taking a look at Smyrna Township, for example, uh, this is the kind of information that you would find on the map. It has the landowner's name, and just zeroing in on that one section there, it has the information of the, uh, the acreage that he owns, it has the squares there, are the, uh, the position of the building on the lot. And some of the other things that you find on these maps that make it just fun to read is it has the creeks, it has the location of churches, schools, and you can also see who the neighbors were. And it's, it's surprising how marriage records end up showing uh, people married other families nearby. So they're, they're just fun to work with these maps. And we have 1878. Uh, 1900, 1927, about every 25 years, and then we have a lot more of the current ones that go into the 1970s through the 1990s. And we have indexes to these. So if you were starting out with the main McKay, but you didn't know where it was, uh, we have uh, an index created that will take you to this map and to the section within this map where you can find it. The 1854 map, I just love. Uh, Janice said, it's fun to look at. You don't see much detail looking at it like this. Uh, the library very generously allowed us to go back to the original. This is a second generation version that's been cleaned up. But when you go to the original, which is hidden away for safekeeping here, you see a lot of detail. Now just zeroing in on, on that section that uh, would tell us a little bit about 18, uh, 814 West Main Street. Uh, you take a look closer and you see, first of all, it's Depot Street. Well, that's now Fragment. There's a street name change. There's the railroad incline. There's the bridge over the railroad. So getting in a little bit closer, there we have 814 West Main Street. So that tells us something right there. It looks like that house existed in 1854. Uh, some others didn't. There was vacant lots on either side, and uh, although it doesn't show it on this one, there's a lot of other additional information that was put in these maps. Uh, the, the names of businesses, uh, the cross-hatching tells you a little bit. Uh, if it's double cross-hatched, it was a brick or stone building. If it's single-hatched, it was uh, a frame building. This also gives you a little bit of a clue as to when additions were put onto the building. We have one set of 1860s flat maps. Uh, it's kind of interesting how we obtained them. Uh, the courthouse did some major renovation of the tower and the clock uh, a number of years ago. 
And when they did, the, the workers up in the attic storage space up there came across a dusty set of flat maps, which were contributed to us. And so we don't even have a date on them. They weren't dated, but they were one of the few maps of that time period in Madison that had the owner's names. So we narrowed it down to the late 1860s just from seeing the names on there and went over someone's estate that indicates they passed away. So if we go to that one section at 814 uh, West Main Street, there were the lots there, lot number six was is in question. And it looks like several of the lots there were owned by the same person, and that was Ware's heirs. So that's a clue to us right there, the name Ware, who was the owner of the property there in, in the 1860s. Uh, one map that uh, it doesn't have a, a great deal of you know, footprint information or things like that, but it's another one that is just awful lot of fun to look at. And this one is, uh, I think City Hall has one on display. We have one at the Historical Society, and uh, we've reproduced it also. But it, it really gave you a good feel. These uh, bird's eye maps were uh, very popular in the 1880s, but it gives you a good feel for what the town was like then, where all the, uh, the businesses that existed along the riverfront, uh, all the features that existed back then, Crooked Creek, before they changed it and straightened it out in the cemetery. Uh, another one that's just fun to look at. So now taking that map and going to the uh, 814, you can see that this is pretty much the layout of the buildings. Now where the Chicago Pizza is there, they had a complex of buildings there that uh, were two-story buildings, much different than the service station. And I'm not sure what that one was. That looked like some sort of a factory building there. But uh, they were amazingly accurate. This map was prepared from a set of photographs that were uh, done by William Heberhart, who did a lot of excellent photography of Madison. Uh, the other thing that uh, Janice mentioned was the Sanborn Fire Insurance maps. They had an excellent collection here, and they allowed us to duplicate them, so we have them available at the uh, Jefferson County Historical Society also. Uh, as she mentioned, not every property was mapped on these. They did it primarily for uh, insurance purposes for the factories and businesses. So there were some residential areas that were not covered in it. Uh, now I've got the 1827, in fact the, the 814 West Main Street did not appear on the first one, the 1886 map. But I did find that it was on the, eight, uh, the 1897 map. Let's, uh, let's go back. Yeah, in 1948, you can see it shown there. It's kind of interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with the Garber House. It sits really on 3rd Street. It's uh, subdivided. But at one time, that, that building fronted on Main Street. But you can see by 1948, several other structures have been built there. Now, if you look to the same map for 1897, now this is kind of a puzzle to me. There's 814, but two doors away is a vacant lot. Now, I'm going to have to go over and look closer at that one that's just a few doors west to see if that was one that was destroyed by fire and rebuilt, or, what the, or was it an error in the map? But you can see that uh, it was not uh, shown as a, a, a structure there. Also, the, the Garber House, that big mansion that sits in the back, had nothing but the front lawn back in 1897. Uh, a lot of other information on these maps, uh, the factories are detailed in great detail with uh, where the storage was, uh, where the, uh, the types of materials, uh, all the things that would relate to fire insurance. But uh, a, a very, another very good source. And you can go through from year to year and see what, what changes have occurred. Uh, they show porches on the buildings, uh, additions onto the buildings, so these may give a good clue as to when the, uh, the changes had occurred. <coughs> City directories, as Jan has mentioned, they're, they're an excellent 
source of finding out who lived in the buildings and a little bit about them. Uh, starting with the 1909 one, you can start with a street address. Anything before that, you would have to have a name. Now, we, we have, uh, most of ours are copies. Uh, you have a lot of the original ones bound here at the library. But I think we're very close in, in having the same volumes of information, maybe in a little different format. Now, if we go to the 1909 and we go to West Main Street to look up uh, who was living there, let's take a closer look over at the 814. And it turns out that William Chandler lived at 814 West Main Street in 1909. Okay, now we've got a name to go on. Let's go over to the alphabetic section and see what they've got there. So we go by alphabet, and there's William Chandler, and it turns out that he operated a streetcar for the street railway, and uh, his wife's name was Elizabeth. So now you have a name to go on, so you could go back earlier from uh, 1909 and see how long he was living there. Now you also have a name to start researching if you want to go to uh, the family history files and learn more about the family. Now, for researching family history, uh, the things that we can offer uh, are we have a small collection of family history files. We have an excellent genealogy collection. Uh, other sources that we have several copies of, but really the library's better, is the uh, census records. And you can find a lot of this on the internet, too. Our strong point in genealogy is the Fonomahalco genealogy collection. Fauna Mahalko was a genealogy researcher. She was employed by the library for a long time, and her collection of research material was given to us. It's indexed on the internet, uh, on our website, and also on the, uh, the InGen web, the Jefferson County InGen web website that's uh, compiled by Ruth Hoggett. So it would tell you if there is a family file that exists that she did research on. Now the other question of how has my house changed over the years? Uh, there's uh, several different ways that we can help you with that. Uh, the historic photo collections, uh, if you can find family snapshots relating to the early families there, and even another source that you don't usually think of are aerial photographs, if you can locate them. Now the historic photograph collections around Jefferson County, we have uh, nearly 4,000 uh, photographs uh, all of them have been digital, nearly all of them have been digitized. Uh, the Jefferson, uh, Madison Jefferson County Public Library here has the, the wonderful Harry Lemon collection, which they are in the process of putting on the internet. Right now it's not generally available, although they do have Xerox copies of them up in the uh, uh, balcony area there, in Janice Barnes area, where uh, the original scrapbooks of Harry Lemon have been Xeroxed, so you can go through the residences and you may be able to find photographs of their property in the 1920s or 1930s. Uh, that's the, the strong time period for the Harry Lemon collection. Historic Madison Incorporated also has an excellent collection. At this time, it's not readily available. Uh, much of it is still on glass plates, but they hope to make that more available later. Now, just taking a typical example of what you can do with photographs, uh, this is a familiar place. Uh, it was originally the Peter Weber house, uh, just uh, off of Vine, just west of Vine Street. Now, if you take that, that's a, a rather current picture of it, and you start looking back, now, looking at a Harry Lemon picture, he was really taking a picture of this old electric car, but in the background, in the 1920s, you can see the porch of that building is still pretty much the same. Uh, the fence is pretty much the same. So that helps you date when changes were made. Now, if you go to our collection from the 1880s, you can see that the porch didn't exist on that house. Uh, some major changes were made after that point. If you were doing, uh, possibly considering changes to the building, you might be able to find details such as the door, the uh, cornices, the material over it. Another one that uh, we're probably all familiar with, if they ever decided to do something to uh, restore the, 
the Moose Lodge to its original grandeur as it is Cravenhurst. This is pretty much what it looks like today. You hardly recognize it as a house. But using photographs, we went back to 1949, they just added their bowling alley to the side of it. But you can see the house is pretty much intact as it was originally. We go back to the 1920s, another Harry Women picture. And you can see that as it was uh, back when John Cravens owned it, and pretty much as it was when uh, the, the railroad president, John Bruff, built it in the 1850s. So pictures can be very, very useful in restoration or just helping you understand the history. <coughs> uh, here's another house that uh, this was owned by Jay, Jay Brettweiser for years and operated as Autumn Wood Bed and Breakfast. This was shortly after she sold it. But uh, this is, if you were going to do restoration on this, now a couple clues are, you can see along here, there's some change in the brickwork here. And the reason there is, is that until they made the, uh, the dramatic changes at the Corinthian columns in the 1940s, uh, this is what the house looked like. It had a large wraparound porch, part of it enclosed. So if you can locate the earlier pictures of the house, it's really helpful in telling you about the changes of it. Uh, another one that uh, was at Bed and Breakfast, uh, Cliff House. Uh, it looks pretty much this way today uh, after the changes that were made by uh, Drusilla Cravens in the early 1900s. It pretty much stayed that way. But originally, we were fortunate to have one of the, the, the photographs of it while it was under construction. They haven't even finished the, uh, you can see there, there's boards up here, but they haven't finished the tower. The windows haven't arrived yet. And that's what it looked like. So if I had that house, I would have to rebuild that tower on there. It just is so interesting. And photographs probably would be the best source of uh, coming across it. Uh, if you can locate the families that own the house over the years, Family photographs, uh, often the house will be in the background. It's a great resource for seeing what the house looked like in earlier years. Uh, this one that uh, uh, right near the intersection, of, right at the intersection of West and Third Street is a good example. We had some people doing research on one of the early families uh, of this house, and they had photographs, snapshots, which if you were going to do restoration, say at that porch, you can see the kind of railing and uh, detail work. And you can also see how much has stayed, how much hasn't changed. So the family photographs, if you can get them from uh, previous owners, can be real helpful. Another source, sometimes it's not a picture of just that house, but of street sales that may be useful to. Now here's a typical scene that's looking uh, east from East Street on uh, second and uh, what's of particular interest here it's a whole series of houses but just kind of look at this building right here now, this building uh, was built in the 1920s so that that's changed over the years but taking an early street scene typical street scene you can see how the porch was constructed quite a bit different with the uh, the entrance to it angling across there so if you're doing restoration on it, some photo research may really help you on that. That's the difference in them between 1910 and what it is now. Another typical street scene, this would be uh, a 600 block of Broadway, which would be right across from the entrance to the uh, parking garage at King's Daughters Hospital. Just a typical scene uh, today but this uh, Harry Lemon picture of the Broadway school there also has some information to, to look at on the houses there. So if you were to take that little shotgun house there and compare what it was like in the 40s to what it looks like now, you can see the changes that have occurred to it over the years. Uh, getting closer, we couldn't find one of 814 Main Street, but just a little bit west of it is a typical scene taken uh, a couple weeks ago, and you look at the houses on that, some have stayed virtually the same, but others have changed. Now this was taken from an 1899, it's a poor quality one because it was taken from a newspaper, but, uh, and also it was, you can see all the wood along here, they were laying new ties for the street railway, for the streetcar. But what's of interest is the building on the right there, 
you can see how that's changed. The addition of a porch. Uh, you might want to be adding uh, shutters to make it authentic if you were going to do restoration on it now. So those pictures can be very helpful in, uh, in seeing what it was like before. Another source, the last one we'll take a look at, is the aerial photographs. We don't have a lot of them. Uh, we only have a handful of the 1920s ones, but they're fascinating to look at. Uh, taking this scene, uh, just to give you a perspective, we're looking at, uh, this is Main Street, here's the courthouse, here's Jefferson. So we're going to take a look at this block over here, which is where the post office is now, and we'll see what changes have occurred. Uh, this is where the post office down is. There was the big old uh, mansion there. And this is the property where originally John Paul had his house. Uh, right now, the Sunoco gas station is over here. The JC parking lot is where the, uh, uh, the hotel, the Madison Hotel once existed. This is now a city parking lot. So it gives you, a, even if uh, it's not just your house, it puts the house into context. So let's take a little closer look at this house over here, which still exists today. This one here, kind of interesting, the porch. What's happened with the porch and the windows and the backyard and the outbuildings? Well, it turns out the porch really hasn't changed that much. This was taken very recently. Uh, certainly around it is different. To the left of the, uh, the house is the parking lot and the uh, post office. So it's, it's kind of isolated there. But it's amazingly intact, so they've done a good job of, uh, of keeping the, the porch uh, lower structure has changed quite a, quite a bit, but you can see that the upper part is still the same. Uh, we have a complete set, and this is particularly good for the rural properties. If you have a, uh, uh, a place out in the country and you wanted to find out where there were outbuildings or, or what it was like, uh, particularly the areas that have been developed into uh, suburban developments now. Uh, we have a complete set of the 1940, 1949, 55, up through 1985, where you can uh, get a, uh, these are probably about a foot by a foot and a half, but we can scan in on them and, and get a lot of good detail. Now this, uh, unfortunately, these are taken from so far up that they get a little bit fuzzy, but let's see what we can find on 814 Main Street. If you zero in on it there, this would now be Cragmont and the curve here. They've softened that curve by 1940. And this is the area in here where the shotgun house would be. So that's the sort of thing that you can find from pictures. These are the things that we can offer you at the Historical Society, and we hope you'll come and visit if you're doing research on your house.
take care of the property. So if you have any ideas for future topics for us, please let us know, and we'll see what we can do. <coughs> Our next workshop is scheduled, and the last one for the summer, by the way, is scheduled for the last Saturday of September. It will be here at the library, 10 o'clock on that last Saturday, whatever the date is. And the topic on that one is uh, weatherization, weatherization techniques for old buildings. It will be conducted by Ron Smyslow from the Historic Landmarks Foundation in Indiana. Um, Ron has put on a couple of workshops for us in the past. Uh, he does a pretty good job. Uh, I think you'll learn something if you come. So thank you very much for coming today. We appreciate your attendance. And uh, keep us in mind.